Are we live? Yeah, and we're live, yes. <laughs> awesome. Hi, everybody. Awesome. Welcome. Anybody? Yeah, so let me switch on the chat. Yeah, here we go. We got a couple people in. Tell us who you are. Go to the chat on the right. Tell us who you are and uh, where you're from. Uh, we got eight attendants. So, uh, guys, if you're. Oh, there we go. Luis Sergio from Brazil. How are you doing? Andrea? How are you guys doing? Sabrina? Great to see you guys. Thanks for joining. We got Brian from Australia. Good on you, mate. <laughs> <laughs> That's my favorite uh, part of the world right now. Favorite Australia. part of the world. Yes. Awesome. awesome. Cool. Thanks. Cool bananas. Uh, we've got Rhode Island, USA. Tony. How are you doing, Tony? That's my best American accent. <laughs> <laughs> I'll try my best. How are you guys doing? We're starting to fill in here. Italy. Buenas, how do you say, what do you say? Como stai? Molto bene. <laughs> New, New Mexico, Zealand. USA. New Zealand, the place where they've got no snakes. That's always a pro. <laughs> Guys, so excited to have you in. She's is starting to fly in now. 83 attendance so far. 3 a.m. in Australia. Wow, that's determination and commitment. Uh, we got Denmark. How are you, Eric? Shalom, Mashlom Chai from Jay. He's in, uh, I'm assuming, in Israel. Uh, India, Rohan, welcome. Ah, Thomas from Berlin. How are you doing? Nairobi, Kenya, Mark. And we've got, hello from Edinburgh. That's Robin Woods. You day, Aubrey from California. Steve West. Uh, she's guys, we are represented all over the world today. I am so happy that you've managed to join us today. And I just want to thank you for joining us on this webinar. People are still joining as we speak. And, uh, I've been really excited about this webinar that we're going to have today. Uh, Bobby Alsinski, a good friend of mine and a really talented producer, mixing engineer. is going to share a couple of tricks with us today. Let's just give it a couple more minutes before we start, just one or two. So we got Steve from Cancun, Pittsburgh, Christian from Romania, Sarajevo, London, uh, Washington State. Uh, we go from everywhere. I saw Nairobi, Kenya. If I missed you, I'm sorry. It's, it's really going so fast on my screen here. We got Canada, India. Uh, so, well, we're on 96 and it is now one minute past one Eastern time. Florida, how are you, Jeff? Cedric, uh, cool guys. I think we should start. So today we're going to do a mixing tips clinic webinar, and we've got our guest Bobby Arsinski. He is a really talented uh, mixing engineer, uh, author, producer. He's really he's, he's a well-known world-known author in fact the books that he has written have uh, are like standard issue in most of the universities around the world when you are uh, looking at learning about sound engineering and uh, we are very lucky to have him on board here today so let's start this mixing tips clinic so learn the hit maker tricks that will give your next mix that polished radio sound and this is a problem that we all face i remember when i was starting you know it's one thing you you figure out how to write a good song and then you figure out how to program uh you know good beats and then you figure out how to record and get good recordings and then comes the part of mixing and mastering and that's where a lot of us fall flat and i remember struggling it was like this big mystery how to solve the mixing problem 
you know, I knew my music was good, but I just had this problem how to get my mix to match up to everybody else. So when it comes to the radio, that's where it really kills you. You know, I don't know how many times when I was starting that I got my song into radio the first or second or third time. And when my song played, it just went flat because my mixing and mastering was not up to scratch. Or when I had a jingle I composed and it played on the air just before another jingle. And when that other jingle came on, it was louder and brighter and better sounding than mine. So this is very important. Today, you're going to learn how to improve your mix, how to get vocals to cut through the mix. In fact, here we go. The secret to punchy sounding drums. You're going to learn how to get your vocals to cut through a mix, make boring tracks more interesting, how to get big effects through short reverbs, and how to make your mix loud. So that is also pretty important. And all of those things I've had problems with. Getting my vocals to cut through a mix, I mean, that's a common one, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm really excited today. Uh, I see we've got people from Switzerland. Yes, uh, Tony, Bobby does have courses on lynda.com. And in fact, he has his own courses as well that he uh, does from his own uh, site. Montreal, bonjour. Boston from Tempo Sync Music. That's Harrison. Um, so get the most from this webinar. I don't want you to miss a crucial tidbit. First of all, please turn off your cell phone. Switch off your email. Don't check your email. Switch off your Facebook. Uh, it's better if you listen to this on earphones, then you'll be able to really focus in. Uh, if you have a problem with sound or, in fact, somebody was complaining connection issues from Anatoly, then please click uh, the reconnect button, at, which is, I think, on the top of the screen. And we're now on 115 people, so let's keep moving. Sorry, guys, who are late. We're going to keep going. Uh, so... Receive a very cool thank you gift for staying with us to the end. So we just, you know, for all of those who stay with us right to the end of this webinar, we're going to give you a really cool gift. So I highly encourage you to stay with us. So the man of the hour, Bobby Ostensky, mixer, producer, author, and a good friend of mine, someone I respect, someone that uh, has taught me a lot, uh, one of the gurus and mentors that I've also learned a lot from, and we are, I'm privileged to have him on the webinar today. Thank you, Bobby, for joining us. Welcome to this mixing clinic. Well, thank you very thank much, you, David. And the feeling is mutual for sure. Uh, I'm Bobby Osinski. I'm a mixer, a producer. I'm an author, uh, among other things. Um, you may know me for some of these books. I've written 23 books on music, the music business, recording, mixing. And uh, social media for music, among other things, uh, the ones on the bottom are the, the latest ones, and I hope you've sampled some of these. If you've gone to a college university, chances are you have, because these are some, at least some of them are kind of standards in colleges, college courses all over the world, actually. Um, I also write a couple of blogs every day of the week. Uh, there's one that's just a music production blog and one that's a... Music industry blog, and both of these are rated actually in the top 10 of music industry blogs. You might want to check them out, and also a podcast. Every week, we talk to a new mover and shaker, and uh, actually this week is David. David's on it, so you might want to check that out, bobbyoinnercircle.com. When I, oh, also, a lot of what we're talking about today is going to come from this particular book, The Mixing Engineer's Handbook. It's actually in the fourth edition now, not the third. But uh, it, maybe some of you have this, and you'll see what's written on the page sometimes is different than what it actually looks and sounds like. So uh, it's not exactly what's in the book, but I'm going to show you some things that kind of revolve around it. Um, when I first started in the music business in Los Angeles here, I took any kind of mixing job I could get and you see the scope on the left. I did, you know, scope commercials and all sorts of commercials. Actually, I did um, the music for good movies and bad movies, a good movie on the right and a bad movie in the center. Um, I also did a lot of surround mixing and I wound up doing about 120 different 
projects for DVD, SACD, DVD audio for some of the biggest artists in the world and some of the artists that I grew up kind of idolizing. These are just a, a few of them that I did. And uh, boy, that was really cool. There's nothing like working alongside some legends, some people that you, you admire greatly. Uh, I've also recently, though, had a couple of minor hits, and believe me, that never gets old. <laughs> I highly recommend it because you're, you're going to find that whenever you have something that a lot of people like, it really feels good. Um, number two on the Billboard Blues Albums charts, uh, uh, Double Crossing Blues, Adrian and Marina Groove Cutters, and also I had a number five on the rock charts at the band called Snoo. So again, just recently, so uh, again... Highly recommend it. You want smooth polish mixes like you hear in the radio. I know. Everybody does. It's easier said than done to get a major label level quality of mix. I've been there. Uh, you turn out a mix, you think it's pretty good, you play it up against some other stuff, and you go, oh, what is missing? Well, I can't show you everything today because that would take a lot more time than what we have. But I can give you a number of steps that you can do to take on your very next mix, next mix. And you're going to find that when you try these things, suddenly your mix is going to come alive and it's going to be better than it started. So here are the characteristics of a, a modern mix. And let's face it, a modern mix is... Something that you hear on Spotify today, something that you hear on the radio, something on Apple Music, and as and this is something that you'll hear. I'm going to say from like the the 2000s up until now, but it was also applied to hits of the past as well. Something that always happened: punchy drums. If you go back to the 50s, that's not the case. 60s, not really the case, but today. If you don't have punchy drums, your mix doesn't sound good. Vocals that cut through the mix is something very important. We've all been there. You do a mix, it's great. You put the vocal in, it's either too loud or too soft. Yeah, it's a big problem. Uh, interesting tracks. And you'll find if you get a chance to ever listen to a hit mix and you start a solo of tracks, you'll find that every single one of them is interesting on its own because it's a cumulative effect when you put all of these interesting things together. Suddenly, you get some magic. Interesting effects, same thing. You really, you want effects that are that stand out, that are different, that are not common. And you need loud mixes. Why do I say that? Well, we've all been there where you play your mix and it sounds really good you, you like it you play it up against something on spotify or on the radio or just a major label release and you go wow mine isn't nearly as loud what happens well if you can afford mastering then mastering engineer does that for you but let's face it if you're playing this for other people they expect it to be as loud or at least as loud as they they they're used to listening to so i'm going to show you how to do that as well and first of all Oh, first, the, some of these tricks that I'm going to show you, all of these tricks, and I shouldn't call them tricks as much as techniques, they come from a wide range of A-list hitmaker mixers. These guys are my friends and people I've known for a long, long time, and I would go and I'd ask and say, how, how did you get that sound? What did you do? Um, guys like Andrew Sheps and Dave Pensado, Robert Orton, one of my favorite newer engineers who's done lady gaga and ellie goulding uh carly ray jepson uh ken scott uh helped write a book with him who's uh one of the legends in the business so is elliot shiner and, and many many more lucky to know these guys and luckily they'll tell me what they do in order to get their sounds and i'm going to tell you some of those techniques today so here's the first thing the secret to punchy drums you might think that just adding a compressor will make your drums punchy. Yes, that's true. But, you know, there's lots of parameters on a compressor, and it really makes a difference. And I'm going to show you exactly why right now. There's a lot more to getting your drums to sound punchy than just putting them through some compressors. 
The best mixers know that it's how you set the compressors up that really makes a difference. So first of all, let's listen to this track. It has no EQ, it has no compression. All it is is just the raw drum track. Sounds pretty good, nothing special, but we can certainly make it sound better. And the first thing we'll do is, let's go to this compressor. This is the standard Pro Tools native compressor. And let's solo up the bass drum and add a little bit. This isn't the best sounding kick drum, although by the time we're finished with it in the track, it's going to be just fine. One of the reasons why I wanted to use this track is just to show you that sometimes you are forced to work with tracks that aren't quite optimum and still make them work, and you certainly can. Listen to what we have now with 60B compression. Now what we're going to do is actually adjust the release. The release is more important than anything else here because what it's going to do is add body to the track. Watch. And if you take notice on the gain reduction meter, I'm trying to make it breathe with the track. We can also set our attack time, but what we want to do is set it very slow because we want those attacks to get through. Watch what happens if I set it fast. There's a lot more compression that happens because the compressor is working on those attacks first. And we want the attack to get through and just have the compressor work on the body of the sound on the release. So anytime you find the compressor making your track sound a little on the dull side, it usually means that the attack is set too quickly, too fast. Let's have a listen to the track. Take notice, it's louder when it's bypassed. And that's natural because what's happening is we're compressing it, so we're actually decreasing the level. That's why we have this makeup gain here, and the makeup gain will equalize the level between bypass and in the signal path. There we go. There we go, a little bit more punchy. And you'll find as you add EQ, it'll get more and more punchy. And now let's go to the snare drum. The snare drum has a top and bottom mic, and I have them mixed through a separate subgroup. And the reason why I'm doing that is once we get the balance, that's not going to change too much. And it's better to equalize and compress just a subgroup so you get both drums together rather than having to do each one individually because generally speaking, it's more or less the same settings and not always, but more or less. And what ends up happening is you're adding a lot more system resources that you probably don't need to. So let's have a listen. Okay, sounds okay. This was compressed during recording, you can tell. We're going to do it again. And once again, the real secret here is the release time. What we're trying to do is get more body in the sound. And you can see how it's breathing with the track now. You don't actually need all that much. 2 or 3 dB is usually enough. And now let's equalize the level between bypass and when it's in the signal path. Now you can really hear the difference there. Listen to the track. Here's our punch. So there you go for the, the oh, we got the wrong screen here. Uh, secret to punchy drums. Insert a compressor on the kick and snare, and yes, you can use a compressor on other channels as well. Uh, many times, for instance, on a hi-hat, 
many times on cymbals and of course on on toms so you may want a compressor on everything else but if you want punchy sounding drums it's it comes down to the heartbeat of the song which is a kick and the snare set the ratio of the compressor low now this is something that you don't see too much people talking about ratios but it's very important lower ratio will give you more punch a higher ratio will give you more control a higher ratio just it takes away the punch though that's the problem you get more control and it'll be steady but you won't get as much punch and of course <laughs> that's what we want so you want a fairly low ratio 1.5 to 1 2 to 1 3 to 1 you don't want to go much beyond that you don't need a lot of compression either couple db 3 db sometimes is all you need it, it you'd be surprised a little goes a long way the more compression you add the more you take the life out of the instrument out of the mix out of whatever you're putting the compressor on so you got to be careful how much you add usually a couple 3 db is is plenty um, the attack and release are really important you start with by, by setting the attack very slow and the release um, longer and the slow release lets the transient through or the slow attack lets the transient through so you get a lot of punch that way and if when you set the release longer you're setting it so it pumps with the pulse of the song the tempo of the song and when that happens all of a sudden it feels really good there's something that's kind of undescribable all of a sudden everything is just working together and that's what you're looking for and then finally adjust the gain so the level's about the same you want to start with this and the reason why you want to be able to tell if, if what you're doing is actually working if you hit the compressor and it always sounds louder naturally you're always going to go with that but if you set it so bypass and compressed are the same then you'll be able to tell oh this is actually helping or <laughs> no it's not helping at all and then from there after you made your, your decision then you, you can increase the gain but when you're first working this out no you, you want to see if you can keep everything about the same same level all right so that's the punchy drums trick or technique and now let's talk about vocals getting vocals to cut through a mix okay so there are lots of ways to do this i'm going to show you one way that really does work it's not the it's not the only way to do this it's one way uh, afterwards when we come back I'm going to tell you a second trick here that you can use as well but watch this because in fact it's going to show you a technique that that does work and it will give you some extra cut through the track when you need it Here go many pop vocals require some extra special fairy dust to make them special here's a way to add some extra air that makes it jump right out of the track so first of all, let's listen to the track and zero in on the lead vocal. Distance between us can't keep us apart. I feel you close no matter how far you are. So that sounds pretty good, but we can make it sound a little bit more special. And we'll do this first by duplicating the track. And all we want when we duplicate it it's just the active playlist okay so now let's solo this up and the first thing we're going to do is compress it and we're going to compress it fairly hard we'll just use our standard compressor here and yeah, fairly fast attack time and a medium release time let's see what we got the distance between us can't keep us apart feel you close no matter how far you are Okay, that's a lot of compression that's 8 or 9 db but that's kind of what we want here we want it to be a little on the squash side next thing we'll do is we'll add an eq and we're going to boost it somewhere up in the high range 8 9 10k and we'll give it a fair amount now let's listen the distance between us can't keep us apart now we have a lot of sibilance there but just before we take care of that what you should do is have a listen to what it does with the track Distance between us can't keep us apart. Listen again. Distance between us can't keep us apart. All of a sudden, it sounds a little closer to us. And of course, the sibilance is something we have to control, but it sounds pretty good. Listen to them both together. The distance between us can't keep us apart. The distance between us can't keep us apart. 
So let's control that sibilance there, and what we'll do is we'll add in, I usually like the precision de-esser, and that's what we'll add. The distance between us can't keep us apart. The distance between us can't keep us apart. Listen without it. The distance between us can't keep us apart. And with it. Distance between us can't keep us apart. Now we might want to play with these frequencies here because we're at 8K. What we might want to do is go up higher even, like 12K. Distance between us can't keep us apart. And it makes it very airy and breathy, as you can hear. Once again, here's without it. Distance between us can't keep us apart. And with it. Distance between us can't keep us apart. Feel you close no matter how far you are. My time. So we're back, everybody. Um, let's talk about the what you just saw. The awesome airy vocal trick. First, but before we go, I want to tell you a couple things. Uh, if you have any questions, we're going to have a Q&A session at the end. So over on the right in the chat, then make sure that you actually, um, you know, type in what you have and we'll do our best to get to everything. We already started with a whole bunch of questions that people wrote in before, and we'll get to as many of those as we can, but write them over on the side and, and we'll do our best to get to them all. Uh, also, I want, want to tell you that these techniques are done on Pro Tools here, but they'll work on just about any, well, not just about, they'll work on all digital audio workstations, as well as if you have a real console, analog or digital, it doesn't matter. The techniques are, are generic. It does. I tried to use the, the native plugins as well. It, they'll work a lot better if you have more specialized plugins. But the so just so you have an idea, and also the type of music it doesn't matter what type of music either. These are very broad, generic techniques. Um, so the awesome Mary vocal trick: uh, duplicate the vocal channel. So in other words, just make a copy of it. Then you want to compress the duplicate very hard. And this is one of the few times well I'll, I'll suggest that you really do this. Uh, 6 dB, 10 dB, even more sometimes. You want to insert the EQ after the compressor. This is really important. Put it after the compressor. And the reason why is if you put it before the compressor in the signal path, then you're going to be compressing this boost that we're going to give to it. You don't want to compress that. So you want to put it after the, the compressor in the signal chain. And then we want to give it a fair amount of boost. 8 to 10, 8 to 12K or so, give it that boost and filter out the lows because we won't need them in this case. And then you add it to the, the mix just under the main vocal. And now you're going to find this vocal that didn't, that, that you just couldn't quite hear. All of a sudden, it's going to leap from the track. Now, I'm going to give you an, another real easy way to do this as well. And it's the better way to go before you get to this. This is kind of a repair job. When you start to mix, put your vocal in as soon as you can into the mix. Don't do the whole mix, all the instruments, and then put the vocal in because then that's when you have a hard time actually finding a spot for it. As soon as you're finished with the bass and drums and maybe one other instrument, get that vocal in there right away and then build the rest of the mix around it. And then you'll find you won't have a problem with finding a level for that vocal. So that's the easiest thing. That's number one. But if you've done it another way and suddenly it's not working and you just can't get this to punch through the track, this is a way to do it. All right. So let's get to the next thing here. Make boring tracks interesting. And what I told you before was the fact that if you were to take a hit song, it doesn't matter what hit song it is, and you go and, and you solo all of the tracks, you're going to find that there's something to each one of them. You can take the most mundane track, like a pad, a pad meaning long notes coming from a synthesizer coming from an organ coming from a big guitar for instance electric guitar anything like that and you're going to find there's something interesting going on 
And this is all cumulative. You put all these interesting tracks together and you have an interesting mix. So there really are no such thing as boring tracks. And let me show you just one way to take a boring track and make it just a little more interesting than it started. Just because pads are used as an almost unheard glue doesn't mean they have to be boring. Here's a way of adding a little bit of motion that's both subtle and effective. First of all, let's listen to the song. We're going to listen to this particular pad right here. Now this is a mono pad. It doesn't matter if it's stereo because the same thing will happen. Usually what we'll do here is add a big washi reverb and that'll work. That will widen it out. It'll make it a little more interesting. But we can do something to make it more dynamically interesting. So what we'll do is add a ping pong delay. Now I can do this as a outboard effect. I can put this on its own group or its own channel. But in this case, we're just going to insert it right within the channel here. So what I want is a really long delay. So I'm going to go to extra to long stereo delay. And a ping pong delay basically means that one side is twice as long as the other. So it will bounce from left to right because you have whatever's on, let's say, the left channel, the right channel is twice as long. So what we're going to do, first of all, is time it to the track. It's 144 beats per minute. And now on one side, we'll make it a quarter note and the other side will make it an eighth note. And what we'll do is set this somewhere around 30%. We want them both the same, so we'll say 34% on both of them. Now let's have a listen. <laughs> So we have some movement left to right. This is actually a little on the fast side. We want it a lot slower. So what we'll do is we'll have the left side as a quarter note and the right side as a half note. So the left side is 416 milliseconds and the right is 833 milliseconds. Now listen. <laughs> bouncing left to right. What we usually want in this case is a nice slow ping pong and the reason why is the pad is slow itself. That's why it's a pad. It's a very long sustaining note. The long ping pong actually works a lot better. You can make it a shorter one but for most songs this will work better if it's nice and long. You can even make it longer if you want. We'll also add some feedback here. So maybe 18-20% somewhere in there. Listen now. A little bit smoother because there's a couple repeats on each side. So, the moving pad trick. Create a stereo delay on an aux channel. That's really important. Put it on a separate channel, an aux channel. Separate um, channel on your, your digital audio workstation. Then you want that delay set for a ping pong effect. And ideally, you can call it up and say ping pong. If you can't get a ping pong effect, just make sure you time one side of the track and then you make the other side twice as long. That's not exactly a ping pong effect because a ping pong effect actually has feedback going back and forth. That being said, it will work just fine, and that's what we did here because we didn't have a true ping pong, but we got the same feel. Now you want to send uh, your pad channel from an aux send. Send it until you get the right amount. You send it to this aux channel, to this uh, delay channel. Then if you really want to take it another step, you want to modulate the delay. So in other words, you put a phaser or flanger after the delay, and then you, you just make it a little more interesting that way. And in this case, you want it as slow as you can make it. The slower, to be, the better. So a half note or a whole note, um, half note or whole note delay, slower, the better, just works much better. You make it too fast and then it becomes too obvious so that's no good either okay now let's get to number four this is one of my favorites actually and it's something that took me a whole long time to learn i have to say and this is about short reverb when you first start mixing you take reverb and you think well the only thing that sounds good is a long one <laughs> you use a long reverb on everything 
But then after you begin to hear what a short reverb sounds like, you begin to notice that, wow, this is used a lot more on records than I ever thought. So let me show you some examples of how this works. Back when I first started in the business selling high-end audio gear, I took a hardware digital reverb bin for one of the biggest mixers of the time to demo. I was surprised that the first thing he did was turn the decay time down as low as it would go and check that sound out first. It turns out that this was the key sound of many of the biggest hit records, which we'll see in just a moment. First of all, let's listen to the track, and we're just listening to the guitar, but listen how the guitar fits into this track. It's just guitar, bass, and drums. <laughs> Now listen to the guitar by itself. It's not a bad sound, it sounds pretty good in fact, but it's only a single guitar and we can make it more exciting and bigger sounding. So I have our friend the D-verb here. Here's what it sounds like and this is just the default settings. Listen to it. <laughs> in the track. That sounds pretty good. We didn't do anything to it, but the D-verb is a, a reasonably good sounding reverb, but we don't want a long decay time. The trick here is to have the shortest decay time that we can get. So let's have a listen when we bring it all the way down. We bring it down to 400 milliseconds. Now, it gets bigger sounding. The real problem here is it gets boingy as well, and that's one of the problems with rather inexpensive reverbs, whether they be hardware or plugins, in that the long decays sound pretty good, it's the short decays that they get boingy sounding. But it still works in the track, so have a listen. So you can hear it got bigger all of a sudden. It doesn't sound like reverb. All it sounds like is a bigger guitar. Now we can do a few more things with it. Let's solo it up again. And listen when I increase the pre-delay. Now this is just about where it's timed to the track at 27 milliseconds. Listen in the track. Now you can hear, all of a sudden, it got a lot bigger. And we didn't really do anything here. We didn't try to make the reverb sound better. The only thing we did is we adjusted the pre-delay time, and we took the decay time down as far as it would go. Now this is using the Hall algorithm, and there may be a better sounding algorithm here. Let's listen to the plate. Let's bring this all the way down. That goes to 200 milliseconds. Now listen. <laughs> That's not as boingy. Have a listen. Yeah, so that's the massive track reverb trick. And the whole thing is you want to make that reverb decay as short as it will go. That's a problem sometimes because all reverb algorithms aren't created the same. So they may sound great long, but you put them short and they'll boing or sound metallic or just won't sound right. So that's where a really good reverb comes in handy. But you'll find if you begin to listen to all, it just listen more and more and more, you're going to identify this. You're going to go, wow, now I get it. Uh, and you might want to add a lot of this as well sometimes you'll hear this really short reverb and, and especially on guitars and you just heard it, an example on guitars but you'll hear it on guitars especially where there's a big it'll just make it sound bigger and wider and fatter and sometimes the more you add the better it sounds unlike other reverbs if you have a long reverb the more you add the more washed out it sounds and 
not quite the same here. So there's lots of ways to do this. You want to do it, you could do it in stereo. Um, you could use the old Van Halen way, which is the dry sound on the right and the reverb on the, the delayed reverb on, on the left or vice versa. So there's lots of ways to do this. Again, this can be used. It, it's generic. It doesn't matter what digital audio workstation or analog or digital real console they're using. It doesn't matter. This will work on anything. Uh, now, next thing, make your mix loud. And the first thing I'm going to tell you on this is the fact that you can be too loud. And what does that mean? Well, you can squeeze all of the life out of a track. You can just make it so loud that all of a sudden there's no dynamic range and no transients, and nobody likes that sound. And the reason why I say that is there's been lots of studies, especially on radio, they've done this, and they've found that when things are too compressed, people turn the radio, turn the channel. So nobody likes it when it's too loud. So, but the fact of the matter is you have to get it loud enough to compete with other people. Ideally, you'd want a mastering engineer to do this, but if you're doing a mix and you're doing it for somebody else, you, they'll want to hear it loud because they're going to compare it to other things. So you have to get it loud. What I'm going to show you here is the way that mastering engineers have done it for a long, long time. The, using analog gear. This is the analog way of, of doing it. We're not using anything analog, but it's the analog mentality to do it. So let me show you how. Okay, this trick is all about how to get a loud master. And this is basically for clients. If you're mixing things for your band, if you're mixing things to give to somebody else, if you're afraid they're going to compare it to a mix that's on the radio, on YouTube, whatever, a completed finished mix. Here's how to get really close to it. Or here's how to finish your mix if you're not going to master. It's actually fairly simple and it requires a compressor and a limiter. So here is the mix without anything on the master bus. Now you can see that it's not terribly loud, relatively speaking, but the peaks are actually loud, the peaks go pretty high. And this is important because we want to control them. So the first thing we're going to do is insert a compressor, and there may be compressors that you like that will sound better. I'm just going to use just the generic one here, just so you know that it doesn't matter. You can make this work regardless of the compressor that you use. So now let's listen, just with this compressor with the default settings. Now the first thing you notice is it decreased the level because there's a lot of compression. It's actually too much compression, so we're going to back that off and we're going to equalize the level a little bit. Okay, so now the level's about the same, but what we really want is hot levels, hot and loud levels. So this is where we're going to get our gain. Okay, so now we have a lot more gain, but if you take notice, we're also peeking into the red, which is never a good idea. Now take notice, I didn't change any of the settings, and usually what we want is a ratio that's very, very mild. We want it somewhere in the neighborhood of uh, 2 to 1, 3 to 1, something like that. So let's have a listen before and after. Here's before the compressor. With the compressor. Now one of the problems is, once again, we're peaking. And that's not a good thing as far as distortion is concerned. In a song like this where it's hard rock, sometimes you can get away with that and it might actually add to it a little bit. But generally speaking, we want to stay away from that. So what you want is a limiter. So find a limiter. And in this case, there's usually some sort of a, uh, a limiter that's in the native plugins. I'm going to use the Precision Limiter from Universal Audio. It's one of my favorites. Now, watch what happens. Now we have the level, 
and you can see we're just knocking off the peaks now generally speaking you can get this really loud if you crank it up but it also sounds very compressed so what we're going to do is get our level from the compressor not from the limiter Now you can see it really got loud there. We got a lot more relative level. We're not peaking. And this is something that now you can give to your friends and they can compare it to some other songs and it won't sound like it's a lot lower in level than the other ones. So that's the hot and loud mix trick. Insert a compressor across the mix bus. The compressor is actually going to give you your level. You don't need much compression on this. And this is the one thing that I have lots of, and some of the best mastering engineers are my friends, the, the people that do the hits that you listen to. And I go and I watch them, and I'm always shocked at how little compression they actually use. It's only a dB or two for the most part. They may use lots of compressors that are only doing a dB or two, but they don't add too much. Um, but this is, you're increasing the level of the track with the makeup gain. And the whole trick is you have to insert a limiter after that, a real limiter. And I think I showed you a little bit without a limiter with the compressor working as, as a limiter, which isn't the same thing. But if you have a real limiter, you set it so the ceiling is 0.1 dB. You can actually set it so it gets louder than that, but nobody's going to hear it. It's not going to matter. So 0.1 dB at the most. Now, I actually would prefer to set it at 1 dB, minus 1 dB, but, you know, that works okay. And then what will happen is um, you won't have any peaks, and you can make it as loud as you want. If you're sending your track to mastering, you're probably going to want to take this off and give them a track that, that's lower in level and let them do all, all the, the compression and making it loud, and it'll sound better. But if you're playing it for clients, this is the way to do it. All right, so you're here because you want your mixes to sound polished and fat and punchy and better, and hopefully what we just saw here really does do that, really helps you along the line here. Um, I, there's lots of questions. I want to get to them, and we'll get to them fast, but first I want to show you this. One, there's one question especially. Is there are some courses online about this? Yeah. Well, here's one right here, 101 Mixing Tricks, uh, my online coaching package. These are tricks that are collected from the best A-list a mixers, like I was saying in the beginning here. They're generic. You can use these techniques in any DAW or any console. It doesn't matter. And also in any kind of music. And you don't need expensive plugins as well. Yeah, if you have expensive specialized plugins, it, it does help. But you don't need them. And I think I just showed you how with most of the examples, uh, which, by the way, those are excerpts from 101 Mixing Tricks that you just saw. And they use just the native plugins for the most part. Um, it's 115 videos, a lot of videos. And that's over five modules. One module is just on vocals. One's just on effects. One's on drums. One's on, on instruments. The other one is on things like automation and, and balance and compression and EQ. You also get a PDF overview for each technique. And also you get access to the Q&A webinar replays. We have Q&A webinars, uh, and you get access to those replays as well as uh, access to the exclusive Facebook group, which is pretty special. It's pretty pretty good. It's active, and, boy, there's a lot you can learn on there. And you get my personal help, too. If you reach out to me with the question, I'm more than happy to help you. Also, it's available 24-7 for a lifetime, always there for you whenever you need it. Um, one of the things about getting better at mixing is it means better mixes mean better gigs <laughs> it really does because all of a sudden you sound a lot better it means you're going to get more streams and you're going to get more views and the best thing that i like and and this is what i have people tell me is i have more confidence in myself i know i can do it now when people ask me i'm not afraid to mix and boy there's a lot that goes with that when you feel that you can do it, and you're not apprehensive. Hey, I was there. I know what it's like to be apprehensive on the mix and go, oh, I don't know if I can do this. 
or I don't know if I can do it the way people want it. When you get all these techniques under your belt that are from the A-list guys, then you're going to feel a whole lot better about approaching a mix. So here's what's going to happen if you sign up for 101 Mixing Tricks. You see a screen like this to get into your account. Then there's a dashboard. The dashboard will have everything you need, all the different modules, Q&A webinar, and some other things I'm going to show you in a little bit. And this is what a module looks like. If we look at some of the mixing tricks, and we'll just take a couple here, there's some great, great um, uh, techniques that you're going to see. Things like uh, one of my favorites, uh, the extreme low volume balance trick. If you want your mix to translate across many, many different playback systems, this is one way to do it. Uh, the effect of automated effects trick. Automation is really important. It's a big part of modern mixing, and this goes into showing you how to do that. Uh, on the second module, this is all about effects, and it's things that you might not have known. The Abbey Road reverb trick is really one of my favorites. It's the sound of the Abbey Road reverbs and how they got it. And there's a certain way you could get that same wonderful Abbey Reverb sound if you know the technique. Um, another thing that's very useful is the uh, never mix, uh, never miss quick effects trick. And what that means is it's a setup that if you have to do rough mixes, this setup will get you in the ballpark really fast this effects setup, and and people are going to go, wow, that sounds really good, without you really having to worry about, oh, what reverb should I pick? Do I need a delay? This will do it for you, and that's just one of the, the many tricks there. Interesting um, instrument mixing tricks. Everything you wanted to know about guitar, bass, and keyboards. Uh, one of my favorites, the uh, Van Halen guitar trick, and um, you, if the early... Eddie Van, the early Van Halen guitar sounds were great in the first three albums, four albums, and I'll show you how to get that. Um, the Elton John um, piano sound, um, he has a wonderful, tinkle, uh, aggressive piano sound that works on just about anything. That's a way to do that. And then there's so many different things here that, that you'll learn. Um, module just on cool drum and percussion tricks. Um, for instance, a lot on snare drums because snare drum it's it's the the backbeat of the song, it's the heartbeat of the song, and there's a lot, sometimes one technique doesn't work, but you'll find there's five other ones there that will help you. And the same thing on kick drums and overheads and everything else you can think of. Finally, lead and background vocal mixing tricks really important, and mostly because. It, it's the most important part of the song. It's the focal point of the song, unless you're doing instrumental music. And if, even if you're doing instrumental music, these particular mixing tricks will work for those. So uh, some things about making vocals more aggressive, getting EQ sounds for the vocals, getting background vocals so they fit, which is very difficult sometimes, or getting them so you can hear them without them being overpowering. There's all sorts of different interesting tricks here. Um, also, you get access to the Q&A sessions. We have Q&A sessions once a month, and um, we record them all. You get access to all those replays, and it goes back to 2015. There's a few years of them. I think maybe even 2014, now I think about it. Also, access to my Hitmakers Club Facebook group. Again, this is a wonderfully vibrant group, and you, you have to be a member to get in. Not just anybody to get in can get in. And it's one of those things where you'd be really impressed every day. There's always something new that you can learn from the people that are on the group. So usually this is $497. And David asked me for a discount. So $297. We can do better than that. But at $297, I brought, brought it down to. And uh, if you want to be get invites to the Q&A calls with me, then three ninety seven for another hundred dollars. But David twisted my arm a little more, and he said, <laughs> "Well, wait, my my people deserve a better break." So, <laughs> and you do, and because you're yeah. on this webinar, we're going to give you a, an extra special discount. I just and, wanted to put, just say, you know, 
that Bobby has never actually sold this course for lower than 297. <laughs> and I went on, on him for about a week until he finally agreed to lower it to 247. So I wanted to do as many people as possible to have and you know, make it affordable as possible. So thanks. I really appreciate that, Bobby. And, yeah, and you can see over on the uh, – and you want to go to 101mixingtricks.com and use the coupon code AMPMIX amp mix in order to get that extra discount that extra special discount and that 101 mixing tips.com yeah and you get and but you'll see there's also a link over on the right that you're going to see in okay. your chat as well but you know david's very persuasive and <laughs> he asked me well we need more we need more from my people so here's what's going to happen in the first 50 are going to get this mini course editing tricks of the pros one of the things most people don't understand is when a mixer gets a session in to mix he doesn't just start mixing no there's a lot of prep work that goes into it to make it what it is like eliminating noises and clicks and pops and fixing track timing and tightening releases which is so important to making things sound tight these are the tricks that the pros use and they're they're two or three hours prep work before they even get into a mix it makes such a huge difference that you might not even realize so i'm going to throw in that mini course i'm also going to throw in a bonus download module and the bonus download module has a number of ebooks a wonderful bpm delay chart and some extras that you'll find that are going to be really useful that you can use at any time and if you order today there's one other special bonus that we're going to throw in and this is a vintage gear mixing tricks course and you're going to say wait a second i don't have any vintage mixing gear yes you do the reason why every every native plug-in array has a number of plugins that are based on some of the greatest outboard devices ever ever devised uh 1176 for instance there's always an 1176 clone but there are secret settings that make this worth it because you can't just throw 1176 on and yeah it sounds okay but there are three actual secret settings on this that have been used from the beginning of time, which makes it extra special. And you can use this as well. Same with the Pultec. There's usually a, some sort of Pultec emulator. Well, there's certain ways to use a Pultec that really makes it special. DBX160, same thing. EMT Reverb, same thing. There's also one thing that I've thrown in there, the Hank Marvin uh, delay. And Hank Mar if you don't know who Hank Marvin is, he's a famous guitar player, English guitar player. But he had a special reverb sound that was unique to him. It wasn't reverb. It was the way he used three delays, and we're throwing that in there as well because it was sort of a vintage mixing trick the way he came up with it. So anyway, that's another bonus that you'll get if you sign up today. So here's what you get. 115 videos, five modules, a downloadable PDF for each technique, as well as my personal help. If you reach out, Q&A webinar replays, or if you sign up, uh, you get access to the Q&A replays themselves, the live ones, as well as access to the exclusive, exclusive Facebook group available 24-7 to you. They're always available, lifetime guarantee. So speaking of guarantees, 30-day, 100% money-back guarantee. You know, I have I haven't had too many people take me up on this. There's been a few. There's one one guy in particular signed up and then came back a couple of days later and said, oh, I really got to pay my rent. I said, I'm more than happy here. <laughs> take your money, you know, definitely. Um, so there hasn't been too many people that have actually taken me up on this. But, you know, if you're one of them and if you sign up and you say, eh, it's not for me, I'm really happy to give you your money back. No problem. And, and hey, we're, we'll still remain friends. So it won't be, be a big deal. Um, this offer, though, the 247 with the coupon code and the bonuses, it's only good until Sunday night. And actually, if you want the Vintage Tricks bonus, you have to do it today. <laughs> so in a very short time period to make this work but you'll still be able to get 101 mixing tricks after sunday night but it's just going to cost you more and you won't have the bonuses so with that david 
Well, thank you, Bobby, so much for your time and teaching us those awesome lessons. Really, even I learned something there that was really great. Thank you so much. Uh, so what are they saying about the 101 mixing tips? Uh, the 101 mixing tricks course was eye-opening to say the least. My mixes now have much more density without giving up any clarity whatsoever. Thanks, Bobby. That's what Mike Oman said. Then we've got uh, Rob Schrock. Now, R Rumor Producer and Academy Awards Musical Director. This is a big shot. Let me tell you something. This is a multi-Grammy Award-winning producer, Rob. And he says, I've been in this a long time, but I've already put three or four of your techniques to good use on recent mixes, and I'm not turning back. A lot of this is making its way into my mix templates going forward. Thanks so much. Um. Then we've got Jim K. He says, I really am enjoying the program. There are so many great tips for mixing, but more important to me are the little gems of information that come out that aren't actually part of the tip that show your wealth of experience and give me greater insight into mixing. I also like the fact that you explain why you do things as well. And uh, I would have to agree with Jim about that. Uh, what I love about Bobby is his personality. You know, it comes across and he, you feel very at peace and uh, it's a, enjoyable experience learning with Bobby. So 101 Mixing Tricks Online Coaching Program. Imagine your mixes in one year. In fact, I think uh, he's been a little bit uh, shy by saying one year because I, if you really put your mind to it, you can have a major improvement in your mixing in a matter of a few weeks. It's, it's 101 Mixing Tricks. These are tricks that Bobby went out and searched for over decades. Literally, if you know his story, he hounded and pressured and irritated producers and sound engineers, top Grammy Award winning guys, literally for decades, and he collected up this list. And finally, he, he reached the number 101, and uh, he put it all together for us, and it's an awesome program. I've actually gone through it myself. And uh, even, you know, I've learned quite a lot from Bobby myself. I always, you know, you can never stop learning. Uh, so, and another thing that I really love about Bobby's stuff is he takes old school kind of, you know, knowledge from the eons, you know, old school uh, um, audio and analog tricks that, that uh, you know, the guys passed down in the studios and uh, he's put that and repacked it into modern digital mindset so you can apply these tactics in a, in any door it doesn't really matter so just imagine what it's going to feel like when you play your music to your friends or if you get a gig or if you get to work with the band and you get to mix their stuff you're going to be confident you're going to feel good about your mixes there's nothing more irritating and frustrating than having a good track and you can't get the mix right and uh and imagine how you'll feel after you know the tricks of the pros. And these are literally the tricks of the pros. You know, there's stories of David Foster and uh, uh, Quincy Jones hanging up sheets over the outboard gear. I don't know if you know about this, but, uh, you know, in the 80s and the 90s, those guys used to hold, used to, you know, hang sheets over the rack mount so that nobody can see their settings, their secret settings. And uh, this is something that Bobby has done. He's gone and he has kind of got this list. So click on 101mixingtips.com to get started. Uh, only you guys are going to get this offer that uh, this $247. I think, uh, Bobby, can you take over from here? Because this is what it's when you get to the, the page, this is what it's going to look like. Yeah, you know, also over on the right, you're going to see the, the an, offer, an offer. You can click on it and that will take you right there as well uh, over on the right on the the chat uh you'll see it there's a it'll come up and it'll on the bottom and but this is what happens when you get to 101 mixing tricks you're going to see when you get to the page you're going to see on the right select the payment option and that's where you select either between the six coaching calls if you want to be in on that or just a straight ahead uh straight ahead 101 mixing tri tricks with the amp discount when you get to the next page though it's going to have a place for you to put your coupon code in as you'll see on the bottom you put that in and then you're going to get your extra special price at 247 when you put that in there um, and then you're going to get an email that's going to give you all the details in order to get into 101 mixing tricks you'll be able to get in right away but sooner or later you're going to 
you're going to log out and all this information is when you want to log in the next time. You'll see the bonus downloads. Bonus downloads is where you're going to get the, the bonus ebooks and, and the BPM charts and things like that. And again, I want to remind you, uh, it's normally 497 and people think it's a deal at 497 and it's well worth it. And uh, usually we sell it for 297 uh, on a discount and, and, but, and that's what we were going to sell it for. But uh, David asked for something special, and it's for you, 247, if you use the coupon code AMPMIX. 347, if you want to be involved in the Q&A calls. So either go on the right and hit the offer button or go to 101mixingtips.com. And uh, the offer ends on Sunday night, though, so uh, you can get it after that, but you won't get the bonuses or the special price. So with that, now let's go to Q&A. So, David... Well, before we do that, well, I just want to say one more thing. Uh, you know, I've been through those 101 mix, uh, mixing tricks, and uh, I think if you're really an AMP member and you've really gone through my mixing and mastering techniques, I want to say that this is actually a great complementary course that you can add on because, uh, like I said, Bobby kind of approaches uh, mixing and mastering from a different angle, a slightly different perspective to me. And uh, yes, there's a lot of overlap, but there's some little gems, really beautiful gems where Bobby kind of goes into some techniques that uh, I don't actually cover in the AMP course. So uh, if you are an AMP member, definitely this this will be a great add-on and complementary to the courses that we already offer. So uh, anyway, let's move on to the Q&A. Uh, and before we get in, I, I see um, a, a question from Cedric. And he says, is this a yearly subscription or is or permanent? No, it's permanent sale. It's available to, available to you 24-7. And uh, as long as you want. You only pay once, though. Yeah. So Sorry about that, David. Go ahead. Oh, perfect. Well, that's a question that we answered. So Q&A started. Uh, guys, so we're in the Q&A section. We're going to start working through some of the questions you've already asked. But uh, what I also wanted to say is if you want to ask more questions, now's the time. Uh, we do have a limited time because we, we're running a little bit over, but uh, we've got, a, I think, about another 10 or 15 minutes for the Q&A. So, sure. Uh, let's start. Want to uh, pick one? Sure. Um, let's see. Elisa says, are you aiming for a specific LUF level? Um, what do you think about LUF levels, Bobby? Unless you're doing music for television or film, you don't need to worry about them. Why do I say that? Yes, there's Luff levels on Luff's levels on Spotify, Apple Music, Tidal, you name it. But they do the encoding. So if you aim for a certain Luff's level, it does you no good. You're spending a lot of time and effort working on something that's only going to change anyway. Because don't forget, different services have different LUFS levels. Uh, Apple is minus yeah. 16, and, and Spotify is minus 14, for instance. So you're better off to just do a CD, regular CD level mix, and then send it uh, send it off. And, and because they'll do the encoding, they'll, they'll put all that together anyway. Um, dynamic range is what you want to worry about. The more dynamic range, the better. I think that's what they're referring to, a LUFS level dynamic range. Uh, what, what would you say... Uh, you know, because this is the problem. Like you say, too loud. It, you can get it too loud. And, and there's been this uh, loudness war for many, many years. Uh, and me personally, I was part of that, I'll, I'll be honest. Especially being a jingle writer, you especially push the, the levels for jingles. But uh, um, how do you feel about easing off the loudness a little bit these days? And uh, and what would you say is a safe uh, dynamic range, a life's dynamic range that you'd be well, happy with? Well, dynamic range, at least minus nine minus 12 is wonderful but it may be it, it may not be loud enough at that i have to say i just did an album i mixed an album where i put my normal compressor and limiter and everything on and i wound up taking it off there was nothing on the stereo bus because it just sounded better and i lowered yeah. the level down and i sent it off to mastering and i let them do it but it was just so much better um you know, I'm not saying that you can't make things sound better with bus compression because it does many times. But there are some there's some music where it, it's definitely better to be more dynamic. 
Yeah, I, I would agree. I, I also think that, you know, these days with the, the normalizing of loudness that's happening on the streaming, and these days 90% of music is, is streamed. And uh, what's happening is you're actually killing your, your, your peaks. You, you're killing your dynamics. You're killing your, your, the, the emotion in the music by over compressing the track and over limiting it. So I, I totally agree with Bobby that, you know, yes, there is also something very nice about the sound of mastering and limiting. It does add some energy and pumping to the track. That's nice, but uh, you don't want to overdo that. I mean, personally, I am for about a minus nine, minus 10. Uh, if you can get to minus eight and, and it's still the track has integrity, but if you, if you feel even the slightest bit of the emotion and the integrity of the track is, is getting lost, take it back a couple steps. When in doubt, a couple steps back. This is what I always say. So uh, would you like to pick a question, Bobby? Well, I'm going to pick one that was sent in before. This is from Tony. He says, um, how important is it to level match the input and output of the signal on every plugin in the signal chain? Well, actually, Tony has four questions here. <laughs> We'll only get to one right now. Um, I will get to two. Uh, match input and output level. Well, I'll tell you what's more important. Make sure you're not peaking anywhere and be very, very cognizant of that. Make sure that there's no overloads anywhere in, in your plugins. I think that's more important. Uh, the reason why, again, this stuff is cumulative and what ends up happening is your track goes from sounding big and wide to start sounding small and small smaller and smaller this is one of the problems that happened in the early days of digital audio workstations where it got a bad rap of people that say oh it makes sound smaller than on the console well yeah it's because of the way they're driving everything they're driving it too hard and as a result it just collapses so you have to be very careful that you don't have any overloads and that's on all of your plugins it's everywhere in the signal chain so that's be more cognizant of that here's the second one he says uh What's the proper technique for using pink noise to achieve initial starting <laughs> signal levels for each track? Uh, okay, um, I can't answer this quickly without showing you, but all I can tell you is I've gone over it in and and there's a, a workshop video. Part if you're a member of my Hitmakers Club, you also get to watch three videos a month three uh, um, not three videos three webinars a month you get access to them one is a workshop where we we talk about new mixing techniques one is deconstructed hits we take a hit hit song and we deconstruct it and the third one is q a and so i've done two or three years worth of of workshops and we covered mixing to pink noise in one of these so if you're a member then you can get access i, I may actually put it up online one day because it's it's pretty for free because it's pretty interesting you pick one I love pink noise. yeah i gotta say i love pink noise <laughs> it doesn't sound good but it's very useful yeah um okay well uh we got a question here from daniel he says how complimentary this course by bobby will be to your amp course i just said that uh they're very complimentary there's a lot of uh there is some overlap but there's a lot of uh beautiful little gems that bobby covers that is just going to add another level to your mixing. And then we've got a question. Uh, Shivam Gupta, who has been with us since he was 12 years old. He's wow. now a man. He's like 18 and he makes beautiful music. He says, I would like him to talk about Bollywood style mixes, please. <laughs> so Bobby, what do you have to say about Bollywood style mixes? Well, I can't say. Says, I have about mixing Indian instruments, but Indian movie song mixes or songs, for example, songs by A.R. Rahman. Or any other song from Bollywood, please talk about mixing and watching Bollywood songs. I, I can't say I have a lot of experience doing it, but I have listened to a lot of Bollywood. Because, frankly, I, I enjoy it. I enjoy it more than Western music many times. Uh, and I, there used to be a Bollywood station, a radio station here in L.A. that I loved. That was constantly on. Um, it's it's no longer, but but it was one of my favorites. So I have listened to a lot of it. And all I can tell you is, Modern Bollywood is uses the same techniques as modern any modern pop music. Exactly. Uh, the stuff, the stuff we went over is exactly what you know exactly what you'd use. So is there a difference? There's different instruments, 
but you know all instruments are treated the same in a mix and it doesn't matter what the genre is you want to be able to hear everything for the most part there are certain instruments that you want to meld together but most of them you want to hear so you know your your techniques of doing that same regardless the of the the genre uh bobby we got moggy says is 101 mixing tricks for edm bass heavy artists well again it's generic these techniques will work on any kind of music because all this stuff is are the things that people have used forever to make hit records they're 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 techniques that and you, let's face it you're not going to need 101 of them for every mix yeah. but there's going to be a few that you're going to use that is going to make the difference in a mix and and you'd be surprised so sometimes you'd go well i need something for the vocal i can't figure it out well okay here's 18 things i could use well, oh. i need something for the drums or i need something for the snare drum okay here's 16 i can choose from so that's where it helps no, no what i'd like to say is you know this is the same question really as what shivam's asking uh, if it's uh, uh trap music or edm or hip hop, or country music, modern country music, or Bollywood music. The 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 mindset for mixing is the same no matter what the style. And it's something that I think that it's it came across to me when I started as a jingle writer. Because when I started doing jingles, you know, one day I'd be doing hip hop, the next day I'd be doing rock, the next day I'd be doing uh, dance music, and it surprised me how. The tricks I was learning in rock, I could apply to hip hop. And the tricks I was learning in hip hop, I could apply to dance. So really mixing is just a mindset. You know, if you actually analyze a hip hop track and an EDM track, you'll be surprised to find the level of the bass is the same. The level of the mids is the same. The level of the tops is the same. The vocal level is similar. There's just one kind of, once you get your mind right about how to mix, you, you you can be confident to mix any style of music, especially these days in the modern times that we at. Like Bobby says, all styles of music have punchy drums. All styles of music have vocals that cut through the mix. So, it, it, you know, these are techniques that are applicable in any style of music. And I think that that's a mindset you must get right in your head. Don't ever let a style of music limit you or make you think that you can't do something. Uh let me choose one, David. I see one that came in before, and again, this is from when you registered. That there was a, a question that asked you if you had any questions, and, and there's quite a number of them. But here's one from Crazy Cuts, and he says, uh, or he asks, should I mix in mono mode or in stereo mode? Well, I believe that you should always listen in mono if you can, and the reason why is if your mix sounds good in mono, it's going to sound great in stereo. I remember Ken Scott telling me ken ken was one of the five beetle engineers and he goes back to the days of mono so he's a real he's a, a legend in the business he's a classic guy but he told me that way back then they would spend all of their time on the mono mix and then spend a half hour on the stereo because they knew if they made it sound good in mono stereo would be would, would be great so and that tells you a lot uh i always spend a lot of time listening in mono so for, for what it's worth i agree with that 100 percent. because uh how often i don't know if you've ever had the situation where you've got a, a track sounding awesome in stereo and then you just switch it into mono to check and then problems all kinds mm -hmm. of problems pop up. but when yeah. you go from mono to stereo it's the other way around the track always gets better so it's always best to fix things in uh mono let's take a couple more and, and wrap this up i think uh running a little late but uh, we want to get as much as we can in here. Uh, let's see what we got. Uh, your thoughts on layering your music. I, I'd like to answer that. Uh, something that I teach on is something called uh, polyrhythms or cross rhythms. And I think ultimately, if you think about it, all styles of music are really layered. That's what music is. It's, it's loops that are layered on top of each other. You know, and uh, the the only difference is that's where arrangement comes in. Arrangement is when you switch something off and you switch something else on. Now, in the old days, you had musicians and they knew, okay, here comes my part. They play, but essentially they'd play a loop that was layered with all the other instruments playing loops, and then they would stop playing at the right part of the song, and then someone else would start playing. So uh, I, th I think when it comes to production, this is a production problem. 
is if you have too many loops layering at the same time or polyrhythms, then the music can get uh, messy and, and get a bit confusing. And one of the things I believe in is, is the less is more. Rather have a few sounds that sound amazing than try and add more and more sounds and layer and layer and layer your music to try and fix. If you're unsure about it and you think it needs something else, you should probably take something out or replace something completely. So that's something I would just uh, suggest when it comes to layering your music. Now you're talking about layering and composition and arrangement. Yeah. There's, there's of course, layering in the mix. And layering in the mix would mean instead of ha <clears throat> having one reverb or one effect, you'd, be, you'd have multiple layers of effects. And this okay. is common. This is mostly, and the, the Brits were the ones that champion this. They, they basically showed the way. They're the first people, to first engineers, first mixers to do this. So if you listen to 80s, especially 80s British pop, you're going to hear a lot of this. But what it is is, for instance, you, you may have a, a different <clears throat> snare drum reverb from a vocal reverb, which may be different, and a guitar reverb may be different, and, and keyboards may be different. So there may be five or six or eight reverbs going on at the same time, and they're all layered together. So that's another way to look at things. It takes a long time to do it, but it really does sound good when you get it. Okay, and then uh, Daniel says that my eyes are red. <laughs> Sorry, guys. I've, I've had a 16-hour workday, so I'm a little bit tired. Please forgive me if I'm a little bit slow today. Um, so, yeah, I, I, after literally a 16-hour workday, I'm, I'm on this call. So sorry about that. Should we take another one? Sure. One more. Well, okay. Um... But, um, somebody said, uh, I can't see it now, but somebody said, so no more than four instruments at a time. <laughs> so we're back to that layering question. Uh, what do you think about that, Bobby? Oh, 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 I know what you're talking about. When I first moved to Los Angeles, I met an engineer, uh, David Holman. And David at the time was, was writing the top of the world because he ha was doing all the Olivia Newton-John records and they were constantly number one number one number one in, in the states and he taught me something that i'll never forget because it was brilliant and he said that in a mix you can't have you can't have more than five elements happening at once doesn't mean five instruments but five elements the reason why is any more than that the brain gets confused and kind of tunes it all out and you'll find that there's a lot of mixes that have more, less than that, fewer than, than five. They might have four or even three going on. When I talk about an element, it may mean the drums and bass are one element, for instance. And maybe there's several guitars playing at the same time, but they're all one element. And then the vocal's another element, and maybe there's keyboards at another element. So it, it doesn't necessarily mean instruments. It means elements that are working together. So if you have too many of them, it usually means it's it's bad arrangement, first of all. So shame on the arranger for that. But you as the mixer, some of your responsibility is also to uh, make it better, to um, you know say, well, we got to mute this here. And that's what that means. I think we lost David here. So we'll take one more until he gets back here. Um, <laughs> I hear one. It says, uh, I see one. It's really good. Um, the, uh, Jan Zeb. I hope I pronounced your name right. I, I apologize if I didn't. He says, I always hear noises whenever I mix a whistle like sound with kick. What am I doing wrong? Maybe nothing. Um, <clears throat> if you're hearing some sort of noise, maybe that was recorded that way. Um, if maybe. It's something like um, it's triggering something in your speakers. There's a certain frequency that your speaker doesn't like. So maybe it's that. Um, listen on headphones to see if you still hear it. So that, that's what I would say. Let's pick another one here. I'm going to pick it from, from my previous ones here, um, the ones that were sent in. Um... How do I ensure I don't, this is from Matt, how do I ensure I don't lose the dynamics of a song compressing and limiting for loudness? Yeah, it's a big problem. And what you have to do is keep on listening. 
to what you're doing. You have to keep on on listening and saying, wait a second, it's getting too squashed. And uh, pull it out or make less. And Or a second thing is, if there's a compressor that you're hitting really hard, and you're hitting 5 or 6 dB, you're better off to hit it by 2 dB and use a second compressor to hit it another couple dB. And sometimes that helps as well. The third thing is, in fact, it might have, um, it might be the attack is too fast. So if you set your attack too fast, you're going to lose those dynamics. So that's another one. Let me pick another one while David is getting in here. Um, um, Okay, from Robin, can this webinar be watched again? Yes, you're going to receive an email with the replay link, so be able to replay it. Um, what are all things to check while mixing surrounds? Um, Brandy asks, what are all the things to check while mixing surrounds? Okay, mixing and surround is a big, long subject. I don't think we can go into that. Um, Let's see, from Trevor, do you have any insights into game music composition or any notable re relationships with game music composers? Yeah, I know a lot of them, actually. Um, <clears throat> if you go back to listening, <clears throat> if you go back and listen to uh, my Inner Circle podcast, <clears throat> BobbyOInnerCircle.com, there's a lot of, of uh, game music people on there. As a matter of fact, coming up is Nick Peck, who does everything for... Um, Disney games, and I think in two weeks he's, he's going to be going to be on. <clears throat> For the most part, now this that's one part where you do have to worry about luffs levels, and each game manufacturer is different, so they would give you a spec on what they want. It's the same as if you're mixing for television. Television each each channel each network will give you a spec sheet, and they'll say this is what we want. We want peaks that go no higher than this. We want our left level here. And if you don't comply, then they kick it back until you get it right. And it's the same thing with games. So that's one place that that would happen. Um, as far as everything else, you know, you're going to mix it the same way as you're going to mix anything else for the most part. You Except instead of mixing a full song, you may be mixing bits and pieces that are coming in at different parts of the game. So it's not linear at all the way we're used to mixing a song. Okay, let's see who else. Let's see who else uh, is in here. I'm going to go to another one over here that was that was sent in. Um, this is a good one. Which is the best, most comprehensive, or the easiest to use uh, mastering software on the market? Is it WaveLab, Ozone, uh, or etc. From Ramon, um, I would say the one I like the best that's the easiest is the Lurson console. I just find that the easiest and a really good sound. Now, I'm not saying it's the most comprehensive. Ozone would probably be that. But uh, if you want something that's easy, it sounds really good. I mean, fast and easy, the Lurson console is the one. I don't know if David is getting back in here. So um, let's wrap this up here. Um, Now, you stayed with me till the end here. I appreciate it. I promised you a gift, and it's this ebook. It's Mastering Your Songs in Six Steps. There's a lot of questions about mastering, and especially self mastering. If you can't afford a mastering engineer, you have to do it yourself, and this is a way to do it. So here's what to do I want you to go to 101mixingtips.com. So you go to 101 Mixing Tips, just like it says here, and at the bottom of the page, go to the very bottom, and you're going to see this webinar bonus ebook, and you want to click on that link, and you'll be able to download it immediately. Webinar bonus ebook. Click on the link, and you'll get that free gift. So thank you, everybody, for being here. Thank you for attending. If you want to get in touch with me or with David, here's how to do it. Uh, I'm certainly open for for answering any questions that you have. Uh, just send them questions at bobbyosinski.com, and, and I'm sure David's the same way. Um, I'm going to leave you with this. A special offer for David's customers, for all, all you AMP members. 
It's not 497. It's not 297. The 101 Mixing Tricks Trips, 101 Mixing Tricks program plus all the bonuses is available for 247 plus. But you have to use Amp Mix as a coupon code. And if you want the access to six or invites to six Q and A calls with me, then it's 347. So you get the 101 Mixing Tricks program, all of the bonuses, plus the six Q&A calls. Go to 101mixingtips.com to learn more. It's only good until Sunday night. David's, David's back with us. We're wrapping this up, David. I didn't know if we were going to make it back. <clears throat> Sorry. Lost but, my connection. Sorry. Yeah. But you might want to say goodbye because that's just where we're at. I was just, just saying goodbye, and I was telling everybody about the you know, 101 Mixing tricks offer for amp members and uh, finishing it up thank you very much bobby i appreciate you coming uh i hope you guys have learned a lot uh you know bobby has shared some really cool information and uh, also in the q a we got to some really juicy information there thank you for your time and uh, thank you for giving my guys the best discount you've ever given anyone i really appreciate that uh guys i just want to encourage you i think what we're going to do is uh, am I right in saying that there will be – can we do a replay of this webinar for anybody who want, want, wants to watch it again? Yes. <clears throat> You'll receive an email with the replay link very soon. Excellent. And uh, also, uh, there will be a PDF download, which you will receive in your inbox, so check out for that. So you'll be able to watch this again, and you'll be able to get the PDF. So uh, I hope that has helped, guys. Um, have a good day and a good evening. And I am going to go to have a nice shower and lie on my bed and have a good sleep. And then I'm going to hopefully not have another 16 hour working day tomorrow. So <laughs> yeah, what do we do for love and passion of music, you know, that's right. Thanks everybody. See you soon. Ciao. Bye-bye.